we had the kerfuffle with Disney, that actually helped a lot of CEOs around the country because they could go to their board. They could say, look, we don't want to be the next Disney. Uh, we've got to stay out of this stuff and we've got to focus on the task at hand. Welcome back to the Kevin Roberts Show. It is always a pleasure to meet with every guest, guest and occasionally we have the opportunity to meet with an elected official. And we only have elected officials on this show who actually make a difference. And I would say at the top of that list is the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. Governor, thanks for making time. Thanks for having us. Tell me about America. I mean, we're optimistic about the future, but a lot of Americans have some real concern about where we are and where we need to go. What's top of mind for you, not just as governor, but as a family man, about what everyday Americans, as I like to call them, should be focused on? Well, yeah, I just ran, I just got reelected in November. So during the campaign, it really struck me that Floridians overwhelmingly thought Florida was going in the right direction, while at the same time thinking the country was going in the wrong direction. And that was a little odd because normally you'd think they'd kind of go, you know, the, together. But I think people drew the distinction between a state government that was really reflective of really solid policies, uh, not indulging in woke ideology and really standing up for them. And they contrasted that with what's going on in Washington, you know, where you have a rampant bureaucracy, an administrative state, woke agenda, really bad fiscal and monetary policy that's causing them to pay more for everything from gas to groceries. And uh, I think that there's the optimism in Florida what was palpable, but you did definitely saw the pessimism about the direction Direction of the country. I mean, I think people know, not just Republicans, they know there needs to be a change uh, and we need to get out of this morass. So I want to hang on that point for a moment. We're going to talk about a couple of discrete policy issues, which is always enjoyable to do with you because you, you actually know them. But what worked in 2022 in Florida, especially you know, for me, just as a movement conservative, the red wave was barely a trickle. We, you would appreciate as a former member of Congress that we have a Republican majority in the House in large part because of Florida and, and dare I say because of your leadership. But what was it in terms of messaging that resonated with people into the center? And I mean, you went by 20 points pretty deep into the left as well. Yeah, look, I think part of it is just, you know, delivering results. The fact is Florida was doing well. You just, you couldn't really say it wasn't. I mean, we had people pouring into the state, massive surplus. We were reducing taxes. The parents' rights thing, I think, totally uh, went across partisan cleavages. Our COVID policies crossed partisan cleavages. I mean, I know I had people that voted for Bernie Sanders who voted for me, and, and some of them would tell me, you saved my job because they were going to kick me. I didn't want to take the MNRA shot. You, they were going to kick me out of my job until you guys did the special session and, and did it. Uh, we also did very good things about like, you know, I believe the left kind of going with the global warming religion, they've moved away from like normal environmental stewardship. So we actually embrace conservation in our state. We've, we've helped restore the Everglades. You know, we're a fishing and boating state, tourism state, really important. But I think a lot of Floridians like that, but yeah, he's right. And then we did do with education. Yes, we did expand school choice, which is really important, but we also did a lot on public education. We did teacher increases, but we would not allow the school districts to pay for anything other than teacher salary, because what they do is they use it for other things. And then that's led into our ability to, to do paycheck protection this year. So I think we were hitting on uh, a lot of the right issues. Uh, and there are some issues that are more resonant with conservatives, but there are other issues that really do span across. And what I just try to say is I don't want to leave the field uh, vacant in any place on the field to the left. If there is an issue, I'm not going to take a left perspective on it, but I'm not going to cede education. I'm not going to cede uh, conservation. I'm not going to cede those things. I'm going to have a conservative solution for everything. You know, it, it occurs to me, this is really another follow-up question. This is not scripted, which is which is great about interviewing you. The I wasn't planning to talk about uh, environmental policy, but I, I think especially for people who might be watching or listening from Florida, maybe from the Rocky Mountain West, where I've spent some time as well, that's the message for Americans. That is to say that we often hear, I know that you do, we've got to make the conservative movement younger. And one of the obstacles to that, the claim goes, is that you can't make it younger if you're quote unquote wrong about the environment. Well, in fact, Conservatives have always been right about environmental policy because we're so focused on conservation. We see actually a moral obligation to be stewards. We're very bad at that messaging. And, and all of that to say, it seems as if you could, we as a movement could scale that to other states for people running for, for Congress, as, as you did. Give people a sense, conservatives who are a little reticent to talk about environmental policy, that in fact, this is something that we can win the other side with. 
Well, I said when I got inaugurated that we'd leave Florida to God better than we found it. And it's a good standard. That doesn't mean do uh, that doesn't mean do uh, liberal policies, uh, but it does mean you know do what we can to ensure that really this this great creation of the state of Florida that we're uh, f- future generations are able to do that. And we've been very common sense about it. Uh, we've not done anything that would be considered uh, certainly left wing, and we've rejected left wing policies. Uh, but I think we've shown an interest in it. We've shown a dedication to it. I mean, it may be is something simpler is like, okay, so we're building a reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee. So people that know Florida is a big lake kind of in Southern Florida. And what happens is um, as the lake rises and there's a flood threat, you have to take water out of it. So the Army Corps will take water out, they'll put it in the rivers. That water really should be going to the Everglades and south. So what we did, we did projects to raise bridges so that more water can flow south. And we're working on creating reservoirs. We've fixed, done some, we got others in the pike that will clean the water and then send it to the rivers or to the Everglades. And so that's just common sense. That's basic infrastructure policy that we're using to make sure that that Florida remains pretty and and beautiful. And that's the thing. Our state's economy really runs on it because we're the top fishing state in the country. We're the top boating state in the country. And then obviously other types of tourism where people just want to come and do it. We've rejected every step of the way, though, uh, what the left wants to do. In fact, Florida, our admissions have declined dramatically based on innovation and based on market forces. Imagine that. So that's, uh, and that's, I think, a lesson. But, but I mean, you and I talked about it when we were at the, at the other event. Uh, they want to use environment and global warming and climate change as kind of a catch-all so that they can advance their agenda. Really, sometimes they have nothing to do with that. Uh, so it's all about them exerting more control over society. They're going after people or industries they don't like, like, like uh, energy companies. And uh, we just need to recognize that for what it is. It's much easier for that critique to gain purchase with young people or anybody if we're also saying, hey, look at what we're doing to conserve these beautiful natural resources we have. Well, one of the other points that you made in in the speech you gave closing our 50th anniversary leadership summit is a a zealous focus, properly zealous on the administrative state. And as I sit here where I was sitting with our mutual friend, Dr. Larry Arn, president of Hillsdale, it, it strikes me that he began this morning and you concluded this morning with the same message which is that of all of the things that are obstacles to self-governance for, for the individual American, the administrative state seems to be at the top of the list. How do we begin to dismantle it? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I mentioned uh, Congress has really helped feed this beast through their neglect. They basically, when you do continuing resolutions and omnibus bills, you're not holding any of these agencies accountable. They don't have to worry. You know, in Texas or in Florida, if a state agency misbehaves, they would take funding or they would, they would discipline the agency, the legislature immediately. I mean, I talk about in, the, in, in my book that we have out, uh, we had a uh, situation, one of the agencies in charge of domestic violence had a sole source contractor, lady who was running it was basically skimming off the top, self-dealing. The next week, the legislature came in and just zeroed that out and and ended it. And you don't have the same with the federal Congress. I mean, they kind of just let this happen when there's abuses, they may conduct a hearing, but they don't actually do any follow through. So it's really about your power of the purse to discipline bad conduct and then legislating precisely so that the administrative agencies don't have discretion to fill in the blanks. Because when they're filling in the blanks, that those choices have huge effects on our society, on people's freedoms, on their businesses. And yet nobody actually enacted that. And there's no one you can hold accountable at the ballot box for that. So it represents a distortion of constitutional government. And I think what our founders wanted, they didn't want any power to be uh, accumulated in, in one branch, but they definitely would not have wanted power to accumulate in part of a branch that was not a, subjected to accountability. So we kind of have the worst of both worlds. We have an accumulation of power within the executive branch, but it actually is kind of irrelevant uh, the way it operates, the results of elections. A Republican can win the president right now, and the left still controls the machinery of the executive branch. That is totally contrary to how the Constitution was designed. We have to fix it. And what aggravates that, we'll conclude this momentarily with some optimism, I know, but we just have to pile on to the realism, which is that what aggravates the power of the administrative state is this collusion between the administrative state and big business. And by that, I mean like the biggest of business. And and it's interesting to me, leading heritage, that we, we, of course, are huge fans of the free market, but I have to remind people constantly in this town, some of your former colleagues, Governor, that 
the free market is the individual family owned business, the mom and, mop and pop shops. It's not the big fortune 50 companies because they've not only colluding with, with our big government, they're colluding with other governments. You've taken on woke capital. And in a lot of ways, not only is it righteous policy, but I think it's really encouraged the American people to say, we're gonna stand up for our country. What are the lessons that you've learned there that you think other leaders or individual Americans can take about that? Well, look, at the end of the day, uh, we do have the capacity to really make a dent in the woke agenda because a lot of these businesses, um, you know, what they do, they've embraced this. Some people are ideological, but some of it is they think if they go left, then that's the way to protect themselves because there's never any blowback on the right. So I think in Florida, just the fact that we're going against ESG, we took $2 billion out of BlackRock from our, uh, our pension fund. We have anti-ESG rules and, reg and, and, and laws that are going to be implemented very soon. We're going after woke banking, discriminating against like a gun store owner or something like that. Uh, that I think gives them pause about trying to sign up for this agenda because they realize, you know what, uh, there is going to be blowback on the other side. And once you do that, I think you've kind of created choices where it's probably better. Like when we had the kerfluffle with Disney, that actually helped a lot of CEOs around the country because they could go to their board. They could say, look, we don't want to be the next Disney. Uh, we've got to stay out of this stuff and we've got to focus on the task at hand. I think that's what most business executives would like to do. Uh, but I do think that the incentives over the last 10 years have been for them to basically bend the knee to the woke mob and try to advance uh, a woke agenda. But ultimately, it's not good for business or our economy writ large to have basic economic decisions subjected to political calculations. A corporation should not be taking positions on this stuff or be felt like they have to take positions. And obviously, if they're doing things gratuitously like Bud Light did by trying to promote transgenderism, um, you know, they, they've gotten blowback and they, they deserve that. Um, but it's just something that is not good for society. So yes, I don't like the policies that are going through woke capital. And I think imposing those on society outside the constitutional system is a problem. But I also think a larger issue is just the fact that we are just not not going to be successful as a country if we go down this road. I don't think you could have conservative woke capital and be successful. It's just not their core mission. So focus on the basics, do what you do best. Don't come to government for rent seeking because that's not what it should be. You know, you go and you compete and you're right. The biggest companies, uh, they like big government because they benefit from big government. It's the upstarts and the smaller ones that are, that usually get uh, disadvantaged. Isn't it remarkable that we have to sit here and remind some of the most successful businesses in the history of this country, that you just need to be focused on earning a profit. Yeah. In other words, and I've often mentioned this, we don't need our companies to be conservative companies. We just need them to be focused on the bottom line. And if that's all they do, then we can get back to seeing prosperity. But in this the administrative country. state also plays into that mm -hmm. because some of these companies will say, look, the SEC, they're coming after my business if I don't do DEI or I don't do all this. So Biden is really mobilizing this massive Leviathan uh, to try to force capital in that direction as well. So some of it is they're making decisions to do it. Some of it is you do have uh, government uh, looming over them and they think that that's the safest place to be. Well, I could sit and talk policy with you for hours because you really are a student of it and a leader of it. But I'm gonna ask you one more question because you've been really kind with your time and, and we're grateful for that, Governor. And that is taking a step back from policy, maybe even taking a step back from the, the office you're privileged to hold. One of the things that I see as I travel the country, I hear is, from, these are from, from great Americans committed to the future, is that they're almost despondent. Sometimes they even use that word. In fact, some of them say, Kevin, we got to pray about not despairing. I gather you woke up this morning optimistic. Why? Well, I think, look, Florida is uh, is really, uh, uh, should be a source of hope for people because well, we were able, as all these other problems mounted throughout our country, you know, we were able to get the big things right. Uh, we were able to make our state a, a reservoir of freedom, a place where people went for sanity and the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, people's satisfaction is high. And really all it is, is yes, uh, being tethered to the proper uh, philosophical foundations, understanding the enduring principles that matter, being right on policy, but basically just having to stand up against the left, the media, whoever, show a little backbone, show a little courage. I'll tell you the courage is contagious. When people see you're willing to stand up for them, they will have your back. There's no way I would have won by 20 points if I had not shown courage in the face of a lot of adversarial uh, uh, treatment, uh, standing up for people. 
because I stood up for them, they stood up for me when it came time for the election. So it's not always easy in the moment, but I would just tell people, whether you're a parent going to a school board meeting who's concerned, whether you're someone running for office or anything in between, uh, if you're standing for the right things in this day and age, in this kind of era of deceit, uh, you're gonna face some blowback. There's gonna be some sacrifices, but you know what? There's been a lot more people throughout our history who've sacrificed a lot more than what we're required to do right now to get our country back on track. Great perspective. That that blowback is a great evidence that you're over the target, right? That's how I view it. I mean, I mentioned in the speech, uh, I've not done any issue polling uh, since I've been governor because quite frankly, that's not what leadership's about. Uh, but kind of my way to make sure I'm on the right track is if I'm getting hit by the usual suspects, I know I'm over the target and I know everything's going in the right direction. America's governor, keep smiling. <laughs> we will. Governor Ron DeSantis, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining this special episode of The Kevin Roberts Show. We will be back next week with another person, whoever he or she may be, who's making a difference for the American future. Take care.